Today, testing, testing, one, two, $578 billion. Hello again, I'm Martin North from Digital Finance Analytics. Welcome to our latest post covering finance and property news with a distinctively Australian flavour. The 2018 results from the Federal Reserve Bank stress testing is out. And as normal, they include the results for all 35 named institutions, a laudable degree of transparency compared with the Australian version. The analysis is the most comprehensive in the world, but it still has flaws in our view. The Fed assesses whether bank holding companies or BHCs, with 100 billion US dollars or more in total consolidated assets, are sufficiently capitalized to absorb losses during stressful conditions, while meeting obligations to creditors and counterparties, and continuing to be able to lend to households and businesses. This annual assessment includes two related programs. First, the Dodd-Frank Act Supervisory Stress Testing, which is a forward-looking quantitative evaluation of the impact of stressful economic and financial market conditions on firms' capital. And second, the Comprehensive Capital Analysis and Review, CCAR, which consists of a quantitative assessment for all firms, plus a qualitative assessment for firms that are identified as large and complex firms. In conducting its supervisory stress tests, the Fed calculates its projections of each firm's balance sheet, risk wake assets, net income, and resulting regulatory capital ratios under these scenarios using data on firms' financial conditions and risk characteristics provided by the firms and a set of models developed or selected by the Fed. And they conclude that all 35 banks will be fine, even if stocks crash by 65%, the volatility index reaches 60, home prices fall 30%, and commercial real estate drops 40%, all at the same time, under the most extreme scenario. They say that in the aggregate, the 35 firms would experience substantial losses under both the adverse and the severely adverse scenarios, but could continue lending to businesses and households due to the substantial accretion of capital since the financial crisis. So that's all right then. But the losses are significant. At an aggregate level, losses at the 35 firms under the severely adverse scenario are projected to be US dollars $578 billion. And the net income before taxes is projected to be a loss of US dollars 139 billion. The aggregate common equity tier one CET1 capital ratio would fall from an actual 12.3% in the fourth quarter of 2017 to its minimum of 7.9% over the planning horizon, but it varies by business. Since 2009, the 35 firms have added more than 800 billion US dollars in common equity capital. Goldman Sachs ended up with a tier one minimum supplementary leverage ratio, SLR, of 3.1, which is just exceeding the required 3.0 minimum the Fed set for its annual capital plan. That's the lowest among participating banks. However, Morgan Stanley was next at 3.3, then State Street at 3.7. The others were above four. Projected aggregate pre-provision net revenue, the PPNR, was US dollars 492 billion, and net income before taxes is a loss of 139 billion dollars. Some US outposts of European banks are most at risk in this analysis, together with some of the big investment banks. Again, the results vary. But I want to make some observations. First, Losses from trading and counterparty transactions were estimated at US dollars 133 billion, stemming from nine institutions, 
including $17.3 billion from the Bank of America Corporation, $16.3 billion from Citigroup, $13.3 billion from Goldman Sachs, $29.4 billion from JP Morgan, Morgan Stanley, $11.7 billion, and $12.2 billion from Wells Fargo. These estimates of losses are calibrated based on historical performance, but given the massive size of the derivatives markets, this is just the best guess. We discussed the size and shape of the derivatives market recently in our post, The $37 trillion Black Hole. Second, it's hard to estimate the potential impact of contagion and freezing up of the markets, as happened in 2007, as each bank is modelled separately. This begs the question as to whether the system-level modelling is robust enough, especially if one major counterparty fell over during a crisis. 2007 showed the problem when trust across the markets falls and margins widen significantly. The Fed does not discuss this critical aspect. Third, the assumptions are that things will revert to normal conditions in just a few years, suggesting that they are modelling a blip-type crisis. Some of the smaller banks may also have performed better in the tests than they would in the real world. Both these assumptions may prove incorrect. But the bottom line, according to the Fed, is that the banks can stand on their own two feet in the mother of all crises. So, no excuse for any bailout then. Well, we'll see. As always, if you like what you've seen here today, please like the post and add a comment or a question. I do read them all. And if you want to join the growing band of subscribers who receive alerts when we release new posts, do subscribe now by hitting the subscribe bell. And if you've already subscribed, many thanks. I really appreciate your support and participation. I'm Martin North, the Principal Analyst at Digital Finance Analytics. Many thanks for watching, and I'll see you next time.